Okay, hi everybody, this is the second part of the 2019 Higher Physics Multiple Choice Paper. We're going to have a look at questions 17 to 25. So this is part two of the video. This was the first year as well, there was 25 marks in the Multiple Choice Paper. Uh, and it was split into paper one, paper two, this was paper one, 45 minutes to do the Multiple Choice Paper. So in the first part of the video, we had a look at questions 1 to 16. We're going to have a look at questions 17 to 25. And remember, your data sheet is at the start. And that's where all the numbers will be that you might need when you're doing these questions. So 16 was photoelectric effect. We're going to start at 17, which is interference of waves. We have got two waves traveling from S1 and S2. They interfere and maxima are produced at the position shown, but we are shown at a point P that is between two maximums, so that will be a minimum, and it's the third minimum, and we have to work out what the path difference is. Well, if it's, it's halfway between the second and the third maximum, so that path difference there, if it's between the second and third maximum, the path difference will be two and a half wavelengths. It's two wavelengths to the second maximum, three wavelengths to the third maximum, so two and a half wavelengths. We're also told what the wavelength is, it's 28 millimetres. So if we want what that actual path difference will be, it'll be two and a half times the wavelength, which is 70 millimetres. And 70 millimetres then corresponds to answer C. Moving on then, question 18, a ray of monochromatic light passes from air into water and the wavelength of the light is 589 nanometers. Now water, we can look up on the data sheet because we don't know what its refractive index is, it's not given in the question. So if we look it up on the data sheet, then water has got a refractive index of 1.33. And then it's always useful to jot that down beside the question, see if you're looking back and forward. Then our relationship for refractive index, it's the wavelength in air over the wavelength in the more dense material, or the speed of light in air over the speed of light in the more dense material, and that's the part we want. It's the speed of light in water we want. So let's rearrange it for the speed of light in the water. Now, I'm using A's and G's here for air and glass, but your subscripts could be anything you want. So the velocity, in this case, of the light in water will be the speed of light in air divided by the refractive index. So 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by the refractive index of water, 1.33, gives us an answer of 2.26 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And that corresponds to answer C. Now the 589 in that question, the wavelength of the light, we didn't need that at all. So watch out for that. Sometimes there will be numbers and questions that are there. Not as a distractor, but you certainly won't need to use them. Right, so question 19. When light passes through the outer layers of the sun, certain frequencies are absorbed by hydrogen atoms, producing dark lines in the spectrum. And this diagram represents some of the energy levels in a hydrogen atom. Now we have to figure out the number of possible transitions that electrons can do between these energy levels. Now this is absorption spectrum, so white light shining through it and the photons that correspond to certain frequencies and certain energies will cause electrons to jump up to higher energy levels. And we have to count the number of possible jumps that there are. So how many different ways can an electron move between two energy levels? Well, if you do it the long way and you count them all, and you've got to count all the jumps from the bottom level, all the jumps from the first level, second level, third level, and so on, then there are ten possible jumps. Is there an equation to do this? Well, yes, there is, but it's not on your relationship sheet. It's n squared minus n divided by 2, where n is the number of energy levels. So there's 5 energy levels here. So 5 squared minus 5 divided by 2 is equal to 10. And that works with any number of energy levels. 
but maybe not recommended. I would count the number of jumps. Let's move on. Question 20. Question 20 is AC electricity. The output from an AC power supply is connected to an oscilloscope and there's the trace you would see. The Y gain is set at 1 volt per division. 1 volt per box vertically. There's 3 boxes there. So the peak voltage will be 3 divisions times 1 volt per division. Means we've got a peak voltage of 3 volts. But we don't want the peak voltage. We want the RMS voltage. You go to your relationship sheet and the equation there is that the RMS voltage is the peak voltage divided by root 2. So 3 divided by root 2 is equal to 2.1 volts. Remember the RMS value is always less than the peak value. So 2.1 volts, answer A. Question 21, we're still on AC electricity. The trace observed on an oscilloscope screen is shown in the top diagram there. Now we're told the frequency doubles, the amplitude is unchanged, and the Y gain setting is unchanged, and the time base setting is changed from one millisecond per division to half a millisecond per division. Which of the following diagrams would show the trace that's now observed on the screen? Well, if the frequency is doubled, that means you would get twice as many waves on the screen. The amplitude is unchanged, so there's going to be no change to the vertical height because the Y gain setting is also unchanged. So option D is going to be out right away because the height has changed on that one. So that's definitely not the answer. But let's think about what's happened to the frequency then. We're being told that the frequency has doubled and the time base setting has changed from one millisecond per division to half a millisecond per division. Well, if the frequency is doubled, the period is halved. The time it takes for one wave will be halved. So you would see twice as many waves on the screen, but the time base is halved. And because the time base is halved, then the screen will look exactly the same. So it'll be answer B. That's pretty tricky. 22 is an uncertainties question. It's a student setting up a circuit and they've measured current and voltage. We have to work out the absolute uncertainty in their calculated value of resistance. Now before we do that, I would always work out my uncertainties as percentages. So the uncertainty in the voltage is 0.1 divided by 10 times 100 is a 1% uncertainty. For the current, it will be 0.01 divided by 0.5 times 100 is a 2% uncertainty. And 2% is bigger than 1%, so whatever our value of resistance is, it will have a 2% uncertainty in it. Let's calculate the resistance then from Ohm's law. R equals V over I. The voltage was 10. The current was 0 0.5. 10 over 0.5 is 20. So that's 20 ohms. But that 20 ohms is going to have an uncertainty in it of 2%. So what's 2% of 20? Just very quickly, we're going to go 2 divided by 100 times 20 is 0.4. Plus or minus 0 0.4. That's 22 C. 23 is a straightforward parallel circuit. We have to calculate the power dissipated in the 3 ohm resistor. Well, resistors in parallel have got the same voltage across them, and in this case, that voltage would be the same as the supply voltage, so 6 volts. So if we want the power in the 3 ohm resistor, then we look up our power equations. Which one's it going to be? If it's got P, R and V in it, it'll be P is V squared over R. 6 squared is the voltage over 3 ohms is the resistance. That's 12 watts. It's a National 5 question, but they always put a power question in. There you go. 23D. 24 is a circuit with a number of LEDs in it. And we're asked which LEDs will light up. Well, the LED's got to be connected the right way around, and the way you remember it is the tip of the triangle in the LED symbol should always be pointing towards the negative terminal of your DC power supply.
So if that was our LED symbol, remember it's always got arrows pointing away from it, then the tip of the triangle should be pointing to the negative side of your supply. So LED P is the wrong way around. It won't light up. LED R is also the wrong way around. And because R is the wrong way around, then no current can flow through S either. Even though S is pointing the right way, then no current will be able to pass through it. So it's only going to be Q. That means our answer is Q only. That's 24B. Last one then, question 25. It's a triple statement question about uncertainties. Statement 1. All measurements of physical quantities are liable to uncertainties. Well, if it's a measurement, then yes, of course, it will be liable to some uncertainty in that measurement. Random uncertainties occur when measurements are repeated and slight variations occur. That's true as well. Especially if you're timing things, you'll get random fluctuations. So that one's true. Statement 2 is true. And systematic uncertainties occur when measurements are all smaller or all larger than the true value of the quantity. Then yes, that's true as well because there's something wrong with your system that's forcing all your measurements to be out the same way. So all three of those statements are true. It's statement 1, 2 and 3. So the answer 25E. There you go then. That's the 2019 multiple choice paper part 2. We will see you in the next one.